Good afternoon. Thank you everyone for being with us here today for a press conference with NDP finance critic, Peter Julian. With Mr. Julian today is Janet Watson, and they'll be discussing the consequences of offshore tax havens. There will be a period for uh, questions and answers at the end of their remarks. Bonjour, merci d'être avec nous cet après-midi pour une conférence de presse avec le porte-parole du NPD en matière de finances, Peter Julian. Avec Monsieur Julian et Janet Watson, ils, ils vont discuter les conséquences des paradis fiscaux à l'étranger. Il y aura une période de questions à la fin des remarques. Alors, je passe la parole à Peter. Uh, merci beaucoup, Alana. Uh, thank you all for, for being here, and we hope that you continue to stay safe and healthy through this uh, pandemic. En, en 2016, le Comité des finances a entrepris une étude, uh, uh, et le sujet était effectivement l'impact des, des paradis fiscaux, et à la fois sur les individus, et aussi sur uh, toute la question d'ensemble de la population canadienne. Uh, comme vous savez probablement, uh, en 2016 aussi, on a eu uh, certaines pressions uh, qui faisaient en sorte que, éventuellement, la majorité libérale a cessé l'étude et uh, ça n'a jamais été réexaminé avant maintenant. Uh, uh, C'est une motion du MPD qui a été déposée il y a quelques semaines, qui a fait en sorte que, effectivement, uh, Aujourd'hui, le Comité des finances reprend ses travaux à, à cet égard. So, in 2016, the Finance Committee had started a study into the impacts of overseas tax havens, both the impacts on the public and also the impact on individuals. And as uh, I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, what happened was the, the Liberal majority in the committee at the time in 2016 basically abruptly stopped the study. And uh, it has been uh, basically staying in abeyance since that time. Uh, thanks to an NDP motion that I presented a few weeks ago, uh, the committee is now coming back to the issue of overseas tax havens, its impacts on the public. And we are starting that study today. And uh, we will be continuing that study in the coming weeks as well. Alors, il, il faut, faut le dire, le directeur parlementaire du budget a fait déjà un examen sur l'impact des, des transferts électroniques et des paradis fiscaux en 2019. Et l'impact euh, s'élève à plus qu'à 25 milliards de dollars par année euh, sur la population canadienne. Ça, c'est 25 milliards de dollars par année qui pourrait être investi dans une, toute une, une série d'investissements qui vont aider les gens. Si on parle euh, du logement abordable, si on parle d'un programme national d'assurance euh, médicaments, euh, toutes ces choses-là euh, peuvent être payées même avec cette montante qui est euh, extrêmement élevée. Et c'est un impact euh, des paradis fiscaux euh, qu'il faut, faut dire a un impact sur la vie quotidienne des Canadiennes et des Canadiens. Euh, ça, c'est des dollars euh, qui devraient être plutôt investis pour les contribuables. So, in, in 2019, as you know, the Parliamentary Budgetary Officer uh, did a, an examination on what the actual overall impacts of uh, tax havens was uh, and the transfer of electronic funds to them. Uh, he estimates, his uh, office estimates, that it's uh, more than $25 billion a year in tax dollars that Canada loses. Now, $25 billion is an enormous amount. That could be invested in affordable housing, could be invested in public universal pharmacare. Uh, there are a whole range of investments that would uh, clearly make a difference in people's lives. And yet, uh, every year, uh, we simply allow $25 billion uh, to, to leave the country and to go to uh, these overseas tax havens. Uh, L'impact qui est senti n'est pas seulement un impact uh, sur l'ensemble de la population canadienne, mais aussi un impact sur les individus. Et quand on regarde les scandales scénarios, uh, North Shield, uh, Mount Riel, uh, tu, tu vois que c'est les personnes qui ont subi personnellement uh, les impacts. Uh, les fraudeurs uh, font en sorte qu'avec uh, le transfert uh, qui se fait dans les paradis fiscaux, uh, 
euh, peut euh, aisément enlever leur argent, euh, l'argent qu'ils ont volé euh, du Canada. Et c'est pour cette raison qu'aujourd'hui, on a un invité spécial qui va parler de, de, de son cas. Euh, une des personnes qui a vécu euh, la fraude autour de Mount, uh, Mount Real, puis en même temps, a subi les conséquences euh, comme beaucoup d'autres Canadiennes et des Canadiens. C'est le même cas avec Sinar, c'est le même cas avec North Shield. So it's not only the impacts on the public at large, it's also the impact on individuals. And we've seen scandals where ultimately uh, money that has been defrauded from Canadians ends up in overseas tax havens. It's the case with Sinar, it's the case of North Shield, also the case of Mount Riel. And uh, so today we have Janet Watson, who is one of the individuals who uh, suffered the consequences of the lack of transparency around overseas tax havens. And I'd like to invite uh, Ms. Watson now to tell us a bit about her story. Uh, remember, overseas tax havens have an impact on the country as a whole, also an impact on individuals. Uh, Ms. Watson, please tell us your story. Thank you, Peter. Um, so, um... Back in 2005, I realized I was a victim of a massive fraud. Um, it was Mount Real. There was $120 million lost and 1,600 victims. Um, personally, I was one of the luckier ones. I lost only $68,000, which was all the money that was in my RRSP at the time. Um, but uh, many of our other victims lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, there was one individual that I recall, he was an Italian man who came to Canada with nothing and built up a business and um, raised his family. And he eventually in Mount Real alone uh, lost two and a half million dollars. And his family told me that he died a broken man. Uh, he never got over it. And um, this is the impact that it's had. We've had marriage breakdowns, we've had stress related in uh, illnesses. And in Mount Real, we had at least one suicide that we know of. So yes, the impact of on the victims, this is not a victimless crime, by any stretch of the imagination. So what happened to the money? Um, we don't know the um, provisional administrator, and the trustee Raymond Shabbat uh, Grand Thornton, was able to recover about $5 million of the 120 million that was lost in Mount Real. But of course, uh, three and a half million of that went to, um, you know, lawyers fees and their fees, etc. So there was very little left to disperse among the victims. Um, at the time, the RCMP told us that they could not uh, investigate this kind of uh, crime. It was they don't have the resources. And once the money leaves the country, there is no way to trace it. Um, the Mount Real Ponzi scheme, there was 120 different companies involved. So the money was transferred from one to the other, to the other, to the other, and eventually out to places in the Bahamas and England and, and quite <laughs> possibly into the Isle of Man. So um, Basically, that's that's the impact that it has. It's uh, it's devastating. Some of our victims uh, never even told their family um, that they lost this kind of money because there's a stigma attached to being a victim. You don't want to admit that you've been uh, duped or that you've been taken in. And most of the victims of North Shield, Sinar, and Mount Real. These were well-recognized companies, so uh, listed on the stock exchange. They, their um, profitability was, was uh, public. Their financial statements were public. They were being audited by well-known firms. And so basically we did everything right and uh, we still lost millions of dollars. That's, that's basically my story in a nutshell. <laughs> And uh, just a final, a final note, Ms. Watson, thank you for sharing your story. Um, the, the money, uh, as, as far as you know, uh, left the country and has not been found. That's correct. There's no, there's no way for the RCMP to trace it once it's left the country and it's dispersed 
into these offshore accounts, which are anonymous, and it's it's very, very difficult um, for them to trace it. Rema Shabbat did the best that they could, but um, it, it's extremely difficult once it's left the country. Thank you very much for sharing that story. Uh, uh, J'ai un, un dernier point à faire. Madame Watson vient de parler justement de uh, l'impact qui était énorme uh, de ces, ces fraudes et le fait que cet argent-là uh, demeure sans trace parce que ça est allé justement dans les, uh, les comptes de banque, dans les paradis fiscaux. Alors, c'était enlevé du pays. Uh, C'est très clair que le gouvernement ne fait pas du tout qu ce qu'il devrait faire. Euh, L'Agence de revenus du Canada a apparu l'année passée devant le comité des finances. J'ai posé la question, est-ce que vous avez des outils? Parce qu'on n'a jamais eu euh, un seul, euh, une seule condamnation suite aux papiers de Bahamas, des papiers des ba Bahamas, de, de Panama euh, et des, des papiers de Paradis. Jamais eu une seule euh, condamnation. Et euh, les les employés de l'Agence du revenu du Canada ont dit simplement on n'a pas les outils. Ça prend de la législation, ça prend des ressources uh, pour mettre fin à cette pratique-là de l'usage des paradis fiscaux. Uh, so my final point is this. We had a CRA employees uh, last year before the Finance Committee. I asked them the question, do you have what it takes? Be given that we've never seen a, a, sole, uh, a, a single case uh, where somebody's been um, uh, received a guilty verdict around the Paradise Papers, the Bahamas Papers, uh, the Panama Papers, and their reply was, we simply don't have the tools. It takes legislation, it takes resources. Uh, this government has spun on this issue, but has never made the required investments and has never done the required work to crack down on these overseas tax havens. So uh, with that, uh, that sets the stage. Uh, we look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you, Peter. I would just ask uh, if you do have a question at this time that you use the raise hand function and please identify yourself and your media outlet before you begin. S'il y a des questions, uh, je vous demande d'utiliser la fonction lever la main et s'il vous plaît, veuillez identifier votre média avant de commencer. I actually don't see a raised hand function. Oh, uh, okay. I guess that's a, that's an impediment to using the raised hand function. So it should it should say it's under reactions. If you look at reactions. Oh yes, Elizabeth. Yeah. Okay. Well, Elizabeth, uh, since you spoke up first, if you do have a question, you could just go on ahead. It's a fairly simple question. The, the committee, the finance committee has looked at offshore tax evasion a few times over the years. What is your hope for this set of hearings? Um, what is the goal? Uh, the, the goal, uh, number one, is to get answers uh, for, for Canadians, uh, whether we're talking Ms. Watson or others. Uh, we have a situation where the impact of these offshore tax havens uh, the impunity with which they can be used is devastating on Canadians, whether we're talking about Canadians who are victims of fraud or, or Canadians that are forced to, to uh, um, struggle because the federal government isn't providing the resources that uh, we should be providing in, in, a, in a democratic society where nobody is left behind. And so there's an awful cost that Canadians pay we want to get answers for them about how these uh, offshore schemes are set up, uh, what the impacts are, and then make very clear recommendations to the government. We, we've seen for five years, uh, both the Minister of National Revenue and the Prime Minister answering this question by saying, oh yeah, we've, we've put a certain amount of money in as if that is all it takes. And we know uh, given uh, all of the cutbacks that took place in CRA, that the investments are not enough, That there has not been a, a, a single prosecution, successful prosecution of any of the of, of those who've been taking their money offshore. So there's obviously a huge problem. We want to identify it for Canadians and have a committee report that puts out these solutions. And uh, we're hoping to do that um, prior to a federal election campaign. I, I would hope in the next election campaign, the impacts of these offshore tax shelters will be front and center in Canadians' minds. 
that we, uh, we have to tackle this and it can't be something that governments just sweep under the rug. Uh, Follow-up question. Realistically, the committee is about to pivot to the budget implementation bill, which is a huge piece of legislation. Um, the time is running out for between before everybody rises for the summer, and there's speculation that either then or in the fall that uh, someone's going to pull the plug and there'll be an election. What are the chances that this committee can actually get beyond today's testimony and actually start getting some answers? Because I noticed in the witness lineup there isn't even anyone from the CRA. Uh, that's a that's a very good question, Elizabeth. Uh, and uh, yes, CRA will be brought forward. Yes, that will be in subsequent meetings. Um, we have a majority of the committee that has agreed to redoubling efforts, and we will have to set aside work for the BIA. You're right to point that out, and we'll come right back to to this study. So a majority of the committee members are very focused on this. And that's why I'm confident that we'll have something uh, that is concrete and that we can get out to Canadians uh, by the time we rise uh, at the end of, uh, end of June. Uh, and the Finance Committee has been given uh, far more availability in terms of uh, interpreters and committee space uh, than other committees uh, over the course of the last year, as you know. Uh, and we're going to use uh, the fact that we have more access uh, to uh, double up and triple up our meetings around the BIA so we can get through that and then come back to this important issue. Thank you. Thank you. I see Boris has his hand raised. Uh, go ahead, Boris. C'est à vous. <coughs> Bonjour, merci, uh, Monsieur Julian. Uh, J'ai une question un peu technique. Um, Le Canada signe des ententes de renseignement fiscal avec les autres pays et il semble que ces ententes-là deviennent automatiquement des ententes de non-double imposition euh, depuis une fameuse clause qui était située dans une loi omnibus du, gouver du gouvernement Harper euh, qui crée finalement ces paradis fiscaux-là. Je ne sais pas si vous me suivez, mais est-ce que euh, c'est quelque chose que regarde le NPD ou euh, le contexte de gouvernement minoritaire en ce moment pour faire disparaître ces ententes de non-double imposition. Mais c'est justement quelque chose que vous avez identifié qui est extrêmement important parce que la non-double imposition, si le taux d'imposition est zéro, ça fait en sorte qu'effectivement l'argent est transféré là, assujetté à un taux d'imposition de zéro. Et puis là, voilà, on ne peut pas euh, faire une imposition une deuxième fois au Canada. C'est vraiment une, une question qu'on regarde et quand on parle avec les Canadiens et les Canadiens, ils regardent ça puis ils trouvent que ça n'a pas, pas de bon sens. Incroyable qu'on signera des ententes comme ça avec des paradis fiscaux. Alors oui, ça va faire partie euh, certainement des choses que, que moi j'aimerais apporter pour le rapport des finances et c'est quelque chose sur lequel je pense le public aussi réclame des, des changements. Il ne veut plus et en, en partie à cause de la pandémie, les gens ont vu vraiment euh, comment il y a un écart entre les plus riches du pays et, et tout le monde. Et M. et Mme Tout-le-Monde euh, n'est plus capable de tolérer cette idée-là que les, les mieux nantis et les plus riches au pays ne euh, paient pas un sein d'impôt euh, à cause de toute cette filet qui est dirigée autour de, euh, euh, autour de, euh, autour aussi des paradis fiscaux. Alors, nous, on va continuer à pousser ces questions-là, puis ça va, j'espère que ça va faire partie euh, du rapport éventuel des comités des finances. Merci. Est-ce qu'il y a un autre enjeu technique au niveau de la loi que vous aimeriez euh, faire modifier qui, qui m'a échappé? Mais le, le fait que l'Agence de revenu du Canada admette déjà qu'ils n'ont pas les outils et les ressources de faire euh, les poursuites contre euh, toutes les gens qui sont publiquement identifiés dans les, les papiers de Panama, les papiers de Bahamas, les papiers des paradis. Euh, alors, c'est là un problème énorme. Quand l'Agence du revenu du Canada admet, mais on ne peut rien faire, euh, ça prend de la législation, ça prend des outils législatifs, ça prend aussi des ressources pour qu'on puisse poursuivre ces gens-là. Alors, ça, c'est un autre élément. Cesser de signer des ententes qui fait en sorte que les paradis fiscaux sont encouragés, mais aussi mettre en place euh, des outils pour que l'Agence du revenu du Canada, euh, les employés, puissent faire leur job. 
Merci. Merci beaucoup. You see in the, the chat that Harvey has a question. Go ahead, Harvey. Hi. Yeah. Um, so I guess my question would be for the uh, you know finance committee moving forward today and in the next days. Um, we, there have been shell companies identified in the Isle of Man that are protecting the identities of wealthy Canadians. Uh, wealthy Canadians involved in uh, massive tax dodge, as well as those who are involved in what are called asset protection schemes to hide money. Um, it, will the uh, finance committee probe uh, try and look at who are those Canadians uh, behind those mysterious companies that tax experts have said that the, the finance committee should look into? Uh, that that's a great question. Thank you, and uh, you you do terrific work on on this subject. It is uh, for for today uh, important to uh, pepper the company that's involved with questions uh, that we then have as a finance committee the ability to follow up on if if they're not being answered. Um, and so there. I, th I think what we'll see today is a lot of questions that are not answered immediately, but the finance committee will come back to. Uh, I, I don't expect to see answers today. I'm, I'm very happy that Ms. Watson's coming forward with her story because that I think is important for, for people, to, Canadians to understand what the, the, what the personal cost and what the public cost, the cost to our country is of these overseas tax havens. And so that is uh, for today uh, and putting out uh, a whole list of questions is an extremely important step. Um, in coming weeks though, uh, we will be pushing down further to get more answers for Canadians as well. And, and uh, I, I did want to shout out to Fifth Estate and Lanquette, who has, have done remarkable work in actually bringing these stories forward, because th this is something that can no longer be swept under the carpet. And just to follow up, so five years ago, when the uh, Finance Committee uh, began its uh, initial probe into the Isle of Man structures, uh, a single witness from KPMG was called, the, the head of tax at the time, but not the individuals who were involved in actually setting up the offshore uh, companies. How can the Finance Committee determine what really happened and what's really behind those companies if they don't call the people who are actually involved in setting up these structures? And that's that's a very good point. Um, subsequent to, to the meeting today, we'll be submitting new lists of witnesses. And, and so I, I think what We'll find this is an initial run. Uh, as you're well aware, there were a number of witnesses that weren't even able to appear in 2016 that need to be brought forward. Uh, so uh, because of, uh, as Elizabeth points out, because of the B Budget Implementation Act uh, interfering with, uh, we have our first step, and then a couple of weeks, um, two or three weeks on the business, uh, Budget Implementation Act, then we come back to the study. <clears throat> we're gonna take today, uh, after the after the meeting and submit uh, other witnesses that will need to come forward and and I think uh, a majority of the committee will be working together on that. Thank you. Are there any other questions at this time? Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres questions? I'm not okay. seeing any at the moment. Um, so this will be the end of the press conference. Ceci met fin à la point de presse. Merci. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. And thank, thank you, Ms. Watson, as well, for appearing. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Harvey. <laughs> thank you.